Good morning. Very lovely of you to be here. I trust you're all well today. And to continue in the series of alienation in American culture, we started off with the utopian community of the Oneidas, just in the 1840s to approximately 1830s to 1880s, and then to the Bohemians of the 1910s, 20s. Make it louder. How's this? It's not clear. Get no maybe, maybe this does it. Is there a volume button? Probably oh, is. Yes. Turn it somewhere. Right? How's this? Hey, you solved the problem. Hey, Eli, you're a man of many talents. I always wanted to be an engineer. <laughs> Oh, there's a kibitzer in every crowd. So where was I? Oh, the Bohemians of the 1910s to the 20s. And then it was the Great Depression on the wall that basically put a kind of temporary end to the cultural alienation movements that began at the turn of the 20th century. But following World War II into the 1950s, there was a resurgence of this form of cultural alienation, which then carried even the Bohemians even further, and this was the Beats, also called the Beat Generation, that many of you lived through and probably know very, very well. So I'm going to deal with the Beats this morning. And the Beats would then flow into the counterculture of the 1960s and 70s, where they fused with it, but also heavily influence it. So tomorrow it's going to be the counterculture, all the hippies and yippies. That's the progression. Now, almost every book you open up, or many books you open up, will be fiction or non-fiction. The author often has a quote to begin. And the quote is usually giving you insight into the nature of the book and the character of the book and even the tone of the book, depending upon the quotation. And that's how I began my lectures as well. So yesterday I started off with Louis Brandeis, you may recall, in a speech in which he talked about bigness. And that fused into the whole idea of a corporate culture and corporate ethos. And so I'm going to begin the same way this morning with a kind of flyleaf to my lecture if it doesn't blow away, or I don't blow away, we can do it. This is a comic routine. <clears throat> it was delivered in the 1950s when the beats were indeed underway. It was delivered by a very young stand-up comedian. He had recently left his position as a rabbi because his congregation told him he was much funnier in the pulpit. Jackie Mason. Hey, I knew you would get it immediately. Jackie Mason. Now, Jackie Mason spoke with a kind of pattern, as you know. I'm going to try to repeat it, but forgive me if I don't get into the swing of it. I'm not exactly in high voice today. Catch me later. But I'm going to deliver the routine because, indeed, it's an emblem and a reflection of what happened in the 1950s and 1960s, which actually goes on to the present day. And so, the, head of, begin, the routine begins with, this is very important. This is very important, he would say. Find out who you are. Most people never find out who they are. There was a time when even I didn't know who I was. It is hard to believe. Luckily, my psychiatrist told me who I am. <laughs> If not for him, until this day, I wouldn't know who I am. That 
happens to sound like a joke, but as soon as I came into his office, the first thing he said to me was, we're going to have to find out who the real you is. Otherwise, you'll never be happy. I couldn't figure it out at the time. I said to myself, I need him to find out who I am. If I don't know who I am, how is he going to know? He never met me. He said, we both don't know. That's why we have to look for the real you. I said to myself, if I don't know who I am, how will I know what I look like? And even if I find me, how will I know if it's the real me? Besides, if I want to look for me, what do I need him for? I could look for myself. Or we could ask my friends. We know where I was. We'll know where to look. Besides, I said to myself, what if I find the real me? And I find he's worse than me? What do I need him? I don't make enough for myself. I need a partner. Ten years ago, I would have been glad to look for anybody. But now, I'm doing real good. Why should I look for him? Let him look for me. He said, the search for the real you will have to continue. That'll be $50, please. I said to myself, this is not the real me. Why should I give him $50? I'll look for the real me. Let him give him the $50. Then I've stuck my money. What if I find the real me? He doesn't even think it's $50. Then I've stuck my money with the real him. I said to myself, the real me might be going to a different psychiatrist altogether. He might be a psychiatrist himself. I said, it's, wouldn't it be funny? I said, if you're the real me, and I said, you owe me $50? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll charge you 25 and we'll call it even. Now, what do you make out from that routine? It's a, what's that? I mean, it's a comic routine, but it says a great deal. It deals with the quest for identity in American society, an issue that did not exist before this particular time. The main issues were making a living, raising a family, dealing with the very guts of what it's like to live in a society that is heavily capitalistic and heavily competitive. And more or less also, which was also prey to all kinds of ups and downs of the economy. So here, the whole idea of looking for the real me and looking for him, find out who you are, suddenly begins to make its appearance during the 1950s. What is this all about? Where does this come from? It will eventually play a very important role in American society from then till now. Because what is called identity politics, the rise of minority groups, who try to, who try to who have empowered themselves from racial to gender to various aspects of sexuality and so on is very much a part of the history from then till now. So the 1950s are the pivotal point and this is precisely when the Beats came along to begin the pursuit of identity. Their pursuit would be different than the pursuit of the 1960s, the counterculture, but it would fuse with it. And you see it most clearly in a movie that many of you saw many years ago called Easy Rider. And I don't know if you will recall Easy, Easy Rider or not, but as these two hippies who were also beats, they fused the two, who take off across the country in their motorcycles and where are they heading for? New Orleans. And I'll explain why because when we get to Jack Kerouac about why New Orleans was important. 
and they go on a search, as you know, and they begin to account the various different elements of American culture as they go from the west down into the south into a city like New Orleans, which is probably at that time one of the most multicultural cities in the United States historically because of its unusual history. And then they come back. And on the way back, they're at a campfire, which they have been at most of the time, as a matter of fact, going down, they're at a campfire. And they smoke pop the entire time, and they're smoking pot around the campfire at this particular point. And Billy, who is the partner to Captain America, says to Captain America, he says to him, we made it, we did it, he said. We're rich, Wyatt, we're rich. Because they had made a killing in cocaine at the beginning of their trip. He says, now we're really free. And Captain America just looks very intently and wistfully and says, Billy, we blew it. Now that is one of the most enigmatic statements of an American movie. And Billy looks at him and says, and then he repeats himself, we blew it. Now, what do you mean we blew it? What is it? Well, we're going to get to it, because that's very much a part of the vocabulary and the imagery and the quest of the beats. This will all connect up to Jack Kerouac in one of the most classic novels, as you know, of the 1950s, On the Road, where they go seeking it. What is it? They were looking for the real me, in other words, but that's a symbolic statement of America looking for itself, or at least those who are alienated looking to place themselves somewhere on the continuum of American society. Where does this all come from in the 1950s? Well, you may recall the Great Depression. It begins in 1929, 1930, and it convulsed the country. One third to one more than that of the workforce was out of work. One third was partly employed. Only one third were really fully employed at this particular time. It was truly devastating, as you undoubtedly know. And so the basic elements of that particular period was just to survive. But it also became a period, therefore, of great deprivation. People didn't have the money to buy their consumer goods, could not move where they wanted to move, could not send their kids to colleges that they might want to, and so on. And as you may know, by the 1920s, this became a consumer society. Our economy rests upon, then and now, a consumer society. The goods that can pouring off the factories have to be consumed by people because that's how the money circulates in society. And so it was at that particular time. But in the 1930s, that was impossible. In 1932, only half the cars of America that was sold, and that had been sold in 1929. And this had a devastating impact because one out of every workers in America at that time was connected to the automobile industry in one way or another. And so it wasn't until the end of the 1930s when the World War came along that the United States got bailed out. The New Deal did a lot to ameliorate the problem, that, as you know, but it was the World War, which was a global conflict that indeed ended unemployment in America, gave everybody a job, and began to fuse the economy into indeed a kind of rolling, ascending crescendo that it had been before in the 1910s and to the 1920s. And that's because there were approximately 11 to 12 million people involved in the armed forces during the World War. And the population of the United States at that time was only 130 million. And that was a huge element of the population. And of course, the war then bailed us out. But the war itself also was a period of deprivation. Because the factories were not turning out consumer goods, as you know. They were turning out conditions for the war. 
It wasn't until the end of the war, when the conversion took place from defense or war to consumer goods, it exploded. Because people had been saving money during the 1940s, during the war. They couldn't spend it very well, but by the end of the war, the whole idea of a consumer society took off again, as you undoubtedly know. Automobiles were sold. The new invention of television came along as people started buying. The radios were being sold. Cleaning was being sold, as you know. All kinds of consumer goods, and it took off. During the 1920s, during the 1930s and 1940s, the prestige of the corporations took a huge hit because they were then assigned the guilt of what had happened at that particular time. But with the coming of consumer goods and even with their success during World War II, their prestige <laughs> took off again. And with that came along advertising and mad men. The very program that all of you have watched over this past year, there was therefore a very close connection between consumer goods and advertising that had begun years before that, but now it became even more prominent and important. People flocked to work in the corporations. People flocked to work in the great organizations of American society. And in order to make your way into that particular society, you had to conform to what the basic corporation was about. Because as I pointed out last time, a corporate ethos had now infused all of American culture, and we live in a corporate culture. All institutions owe their obeyance to the corporation, whether it be religious, or university, or camps, or whatever the case may be. Corporate ethos infuses all of our mentality, our attitude, our economics, indeed, our politics as well. In order to make their way into the corporation, there was great emphasis upon conformity and uniformity. That also coincided, you may recall, with all of the new housing that came along, the suburban housing, which was mass manufactured, and all look, began to look alike. As, I can't hear you for it. Eleven houses. Yes, exactly. You got it. And so a whole wave of conformity reflected itself in Brooks Brothers suits, the button-down <coughs> suits with the ties, right, and the shirts, and so on. That also coincided with the great political repression of McCarthyism. So you not only had a kind of con cultural conformity developing at this time, but a political conformity as well. This was best picked up by John Steinbeck and other well, it shows itself in movies, but in other novels. But John Steinbeck, one of our leading novelists, records this in one of his very good novels, which I shall now quote to you, if I can get it. Roosevelt, 1932, also brought back the country. Roosevelt, FDR. 1932 as well? FDR, yes. in 1932, before that he was a governor. Yes. And in 1932, he became president, and Roosevelt did a lot to bring the country together. No, with I, didn't the, say, I didn't say anything. They ameliorated a lot of the effects of the Great Depression. But there was nevertheless still remaining a huge number of unemployed... Oh, yeah, yeah. You know. But he did a lot. Oh, he did... Hey. He one, of my, one of my heroes. Yeah, yes, are. you're absolutely oh, right. He was good to the America, but he wasn't good to the Jews. We'll talk about this later. Later. It doesn't matter. Sure it matters. So, John Steinbeck, in the wayward bus. Mr. Pritchard was a businessman, president of a medium-sized corporation. He was never alone. His business was conducted by groups of men who worked alike, thought alike, and even looked alike. His lunches were with men like himself who joined together in clubs so that no foreign element or idea could enter. 
His religious life was again his lodge, his church, both of which were screened and protected. Once a week, he played poker with men so exactly like himself that the game was fairly even. And from this fact, the group was convinced they were very fine poker players. Wherever he went, he was not one man, but a unit in a corporation, a unit in a club, in a lodge, in a church, in a political party. His thoughts and ideas were never subjected to criticism since he willingly associated only with people like himself. He read a newspaper written by and for his group. The books that came into his house were chosen by a committee which deleted material that might irritate or offend him. He hated foreign countries and foreigners because it was difficult to find his counterpart in them. He did not want to stand out from his group. He would have liked to have risen to the top of it and be admired by it, but it would not occur to him to leave it. On at occasional stags, where naked girls danced on the tables and sat in great glasses of wine, Mr. Pritchett howled with laughter and drank the wine, but 500 Mr. Pritchards were there with him. And then Stein and Beck then goes on to twist it for you. At bottom, and originally, Mr. Pritchett was not like this. He had once voted for Eugene V. Depps. Thank you. Thank you. He had once voted for Eugene V. Debs, but that is a long time ago. It was just that people in his group watched one another. Any variation from a code of conduct was first noted, then discussed. A man who varied was not a sound man, and if he persisted, no one would do business with him. Protective coloring was truly protective, but there was no doubt. No double life in Mr. Pritchard. He had given up his freedom and then forgotten what it was like. He thought of it now as youthful folly. On the other side of the Atlantic, was a well-known English poet. W.H. Auden. He wrote a poem that has since become, he wrote a poem that has since become a classic which reflects this very idea of conformity and unified togetherness at the exclusion of everything else on the outside. It's entitled, in brackets, to J.B. slash 07 slash M slash 378. This marble monument is erected by the state. He was found by the Bureau of Statistics to be one against whom there was no official complaint. And all the reports on his conduct agree that in the modern sense of the old fashioned word, he was a saint. For in everything he did, he served the greater community. Except for the war, till the day he retired, he worked in a factory and never got fired. But satisfied his employees, Ford Motors Incorporated, yes, he was not the scab or odd in his views. For our union reports that he paid his dues. Our report in his union shows he was sound, and our social psychology work is found that he was popular with his mates and liked a drink. The press are convinced that he bought a paper every day and that his reactions to advertisements were normal in every way. Policies taken out in his name prove that he was fully insured and his health card shows that he was once in a hospital but left it cured. Both producers research and high-grade living declare he was fully sensitive to the advantages 
of the installment plan. And had everything necessary to the modern man. A photograph, a radio, a car, and a refrigerator. I was certain researchers at the public opinion are content that he held the proper opinions for the time of year. When there was peace, he was for peace. When there was war, he went. He was married and added five children to the population, which our eugenicist says are the right number of the parent of his generation. And our teachers report that he never interfered with their education. Was he free? Was he happy? The question is absurd. Had anything been wrong, we certainly should have heard. And so, this was the zeitgeist of the United States. Mike. In the 1950s, you heard zeitgeist, didn't you? Yeah. I'll get back to this in a minute. This was the zeitgeist at that particular time when a group of very young guys who met in New York and other places, the Midwest and so on, that would go on to become the Beats that rebelled against all of this. And their rebellion came to be called the Beat Generation. I always heard Beatnik. What? Well, it comes, Beatnik means... It's a, it's, a, it's a black expression of it, to be beat, to be cool, to be out of sync with things. The definition goes something like this. Beat, cool, hip, swinging language reflects nothing concrete. Well, chaos rules existence, constantly shifting out of grasp. But what they also rebelled against the beats was one of the most important books as they reflected, most important books to come out in the 1950s, which was absolutely remarkable, which indicated all of this and will really pinpoint the problem to you and which will pinpoint to them too. It was a book that came out in the mid-1950s. It was called The Organization Man. It was on the pop popular seller list for a long, long time. Now, what was most remarkable about this book that deals with the organization man is that it was written by William H. White, Jr., W-H-Y-T-E. If White was a liberal professor at a university, he could have been dismissed. He was the sociologist, if he was socialist, he would have been dismissed, right? Anything like that, but that was not who White was. He was the associate editor of Fortune magazine, one of the leading capitalist journals in America, if not the world. His take on what was going on in his world was absolutely astonishing, but it pinpoints it directly. And I'm going to quote directly. This book, he says in his introduction, is about the organization man. If the term is vague, it is because I can think of no other way to describe the people I am talking about. They are not the workers, nor are they, they are the white collar people in the usual clerk sense of the word. These people only work for the organization. The ones I'm talking about belong meaning capital letters, belong to it as well. They are the ones of our middle class who have left home, spiritually as well as physically, to take the vows of organization life. And it is they who are the mind and soul of our great self-perpetuating institutions. Only if you are top managers or ever will be. In a system that makes such hazy terminology as junior, Executive, unnecessary, they are of the staff as well as of the line. And they are always destined to live in that middle group, but the euphemism holds. The corporation man is the most conspicuous example, for he is only one. For the collectivization so visible in the corporation has affected almost every field of work. Blood brother to the business trainee, 
off to join DuPont is a seminary student who will end up in the church hierarchy. The doctor headed for the corporate clinic, the physics PhD in the government laboratory, the intellectual and the foundation sponsored team project, the engineering graduate in the huge drafting room at Lockheed, the young apprentice in a Wall Street law factory. They are all, as I so often put it, in the same boat. They are, and he goes on, the organization. Now, again, had this been written by someone who was really disgruntled by American society, truly alienated by it, but it was written by an insider, a man who began to perceive what was happening in his own life. And so, like the Bohemians, the Beats rejected all of this and began to create a whole new way of life to live in a new, in a new identity. So what did they do? Is that they concentrated on stretching the whole limits of creativity, as had the Bohemians. They experimented with the artistic self, as did the Bohemians. They explored sexual impulses, going much further than what the Bohemians had done. They attacked authority, obviously, in institutions. They were out to achieve a sense of self. Their rebellion begins. Can I interject something? What? May, may I interject something? I'm sorry, I can't hear. That group of Bohemians. They go to New Orleans, they go to Hay Hasbury. They're rich people's children. They're being supported by their parents. They're not working. And it's a phenomenon that lasts quite a while. Um, to what extent Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg right. and Corson were, were actually supported by their families is actually quite dubious. They lived a very simple life. Let me quickly explain, since you raised that question. You do, re do you recall the architecture of the Victorian period in America? No. Well, what about the internal furnishings of the Victorian house or apartment? Very lavish. Very lavish. What else? Heavy furniture? Heavy. Brocades, right? Okay. On the walls were appearing heavy drapes and so on. But how do you account for that architecture? What values does it reflect? Because all furniture reflects values of society. So what values are reflected in Victorian America with their heavy duty furniture and everything else? Stolidity. Stolidity. They are rooted, in other words. But along with the Bohemians and then the Beats and the counterculture, all that disappeared. You could see it most clearly in classrooms that were then rooted right then. Some the, the, uh, the seats became mobile, right? So that they did not, they didn't need the accoutrements of their fathers and mothers. They developed a whole new way of life. The rebellion began with a very interesting process. You may recall in the 1950s, Everything became automated. Automation begins in America at that particular time when things are then translated into a digital process. Right? Which company started this? IBM. IBM. What? IBM, IBM was instrumental, but what company therefore really got into it? AT&T, AT the telephone company. How many of you remember your fathers and grandfathers and mothers' telephone numbers back in the 1930s? You don't remember it? I didn't yeah. have a number. You didn't have a number. You didn't have a telephone. Yeah. Dayton, Dayton 9. Dayton 9, 8291. There you go. I have a 46532. There you go. My parents' number was Nightingale 83687. And look, I was just a young kid. So how did you dial Nightingale 8? You dialed NI. Or if you lived in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, SH. And then you would dial the number. There was a literary component that went along with numbers in America. AT&T changed that completely. 
And there were many rebellions that sprang up all across the country to this. One young guy in Carmel, California, disclosed Friday that he did something about the telephone company's recent numbering change, which eliminated letters and designations. When the time came to pay his bill, he did by numbers. Bale said he made out the check too. 7224342 which figures Pacific Telephone when you dial. He then signed the check 2622473 Bob Baird on the dial. Baird then mailed the check and waited to see what will happen. The service was cut off. <laughs> So, many rebellions began to spring up all across the country, but in New York City, a particularly young group of guys got together, and women as well, and they began to establish a new way of life. Now, they wouldn't have been noticed, except for the fact that they were doing something very unusual in one of the most pronounced and cultural cities in America, namely New York. But they began to do, to, do, to institute new artistic forms. They turned to poetry writing. They turned to using jazz in different ways. They combined jazz with poetry readings, which was extremely unusual because black music was still regarded as lower class music. They elevated jazz into a new kind of art form, which jazz is actually becoming unto itself. And folk music. Folk music, absolutely. What else? You got it, the whole thing. So what was the nexus or locus or nub of the beat generation to be summed up very quickly? So that's a, like a, a wheel, the nub and the wheel just curves around, but the nub of the wheel was put perfectly by Kenneth Rexroth, who was one of the poets of the beat generation. And he called his article, disengagement, the art of the beat generation. And what he wrote was perfect. He starts off by saying, Dylan Thomas, who was Dylan Thomas? Poet. A Welsh poet, correct. And Charlie Parker. Who was Charlie Parker? Saxophonist. Saxophone. Yes. A jazz saxophonist. He's combining these two figures, which is very unusual. <laughs> Dylan Thomas and Charlie Parker here up communicate one central theme. Against the ruin of the world, there is only one defense. The creative act. This is, of course, the theme of art and poetry. Against the ruin of the world, and he was referring to now the development of the atomic bomb and the possibility of thermonuclear warfare, which was quite possible because this was during the time of the Cold War, as you know. Against the ruin of the world, there was only one defense, the creative act. Now, in order to find out the creative act, they began to experiment. They began to experiment with things that are now very commonplace in the United States, but at that time was new. They began to experiment with drugs. Because they were going to find it to come back. They wanted to find their true selves. They wanted to find them where they were. Just like Jackie Mason talked about, they have to find the real selves. So they began to experiment with drugs. And they began to experiment with different kinds of group therapies that were now becoming prominent at that particular time. They began to look into pieces like yoga. What? Even promiscuity was on the rise. Like, um, promiscuity. promiscuity was on the rise. <laughs> promiscuity. Promiscuity? Yes, they were into sexual promiscuity of the highest order. Yes. Um, where was I? Oh, yes. 
and other kinds of experiments that we will get into. And they took off across the United States looking for themselves and looking for it. Now the most famous expression of all that was Jack Kerouac's On the Road. It became one of the most popular books of the 1950s into the 60s and remains today even a, a read, very well read book. I don't know if you've ever, you ever read On the Road or looked at it. Most people haven't, interestingly enough. There's a very good review of it appeared in the New York Times because a movie was finally made about On the Road. And this reviewer deals with both the novel and the movie. And he sums it up so well, I thought I would unquote to you from it. He starts out by saying, the surprising thing isn't that On the Road took so long to be made into a movie. Jack Kerouac's novel was published in 1957. The film, starring so-and-so, finally opened. What is surprising, perhaps, is that someone bothered to make a movie of On the Road at all. So much of the novel has percolated thoroughly through the, through the culture. Most people who never read the novel feel as if they have done so. It is a familiar term. You wouldn't be surprised if they felt that they watched it also. The film On the Road doesn't have much of a plot. It's episodic. More a set of circumstances and impressions than any sort of well wrought narrative. And that's because On the Road doesn't have a plot. It's a series of trips. I th I'm sorry to interrupt. But I think we should interject the politics of the time in the beginning of the anti-war movement, Vietnam, and that all contributes to that so-called finding yourself. He hasn't gotten there yet. I didn't hear all so the vet, the vet, Could you read? This is a little She's early. She's concerned with you not mentioning the uh, anti-war and the Vietnam War and what was going on then. Oh, and well, the problem with the anti-Vietnam protests and the war is that that occurs in the 1960s into the 70s, and I'm dealing with the 1950s. I deal with the Cold War that was operative at that particular time. Okay? And when Korea exploded in 1951, when the North Koreans invaded South Korea, heightening the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, It's at that particular time that the beats are on the way, and we'll deal with that. So the movie tells you, as does the novel, that the characters drive and hitchhike and take the bus crisscrossing the United States down into Mexico. Now the reason why On the Road has become a classic insofar as you know, as the phrase is concerned is that we are the most mobile society in history. We fell in love with the automobile the minute it was invented. We began developing roads the minute the automobile was possible. The federal government along with states collaborated in building roads and then expanding the roads, and so on. By the 1920s, the automobile was so well established in American society that many people gave up a lot just to own an automobile. By the 1930s, all kinds of new institutions developed, like motels and food carts and camps all across the United and people became mobile. Even during the Great Depression, the federal government supported people maintaining their automobiles so they could find work. From that day to this, the automobile is an integral part of the culture. So On the Road's title is symbolic of all of this kind of mobility and our relationship to the automobile, which again, 
is astonishing in a society that covers 3,000 miles from one side to the other. And it's a cost to this end that, again, I repeat, Eisenhower's policy established the superhighway in America. Incredible that you can now drive from New York to the East Coast to the West Coast without hitting a single light. So on the road plays into that particular feature. And it was Kerouac who becomes the historian of it, particularly with the very first trip. But before he even took the trip with his friends, driving from New York down to New Orleans, which was the very first major trip, he hitchhiked across the country as a young guy. 20, 19, 20, 21. In the spring of 1949, he writes it on the road. I had a few dollars saved from my GI education checks. And I went to Denver, thinking of settling down. I saw myself in middle America. I was lonesome. Nobody was there. None of my friends. So I wandered around the streets, worked at a wholesale fruit market where I almost got hired in 1947, the hardest job of my life. And I then moved around, just trying to find the sense of the city and where I was at, looking for his identity, for the real him. At dusk, I walked. I felt like a speck on the surface of the sad red earth. At lilac evening, I walked with every muscles aching among the lights of 27th and Wellington Street in the Denver colored section, wishing I were a Negro. Feeling that the best the white world had offered was not enough ecstasy for me. Not enough life, joy, kicks, darkness, music. Not enough night. I stopped at a little shack where a man sold hot, really checking in a paper container. I bought some and ate it strolling into the dark, mysterious streets. I wish I were a Denver Mexican or even a poor, overworked Japanese. Anything but what I was so dreamily a white man. Disillusioned. All my life, I had white ambitions. That's why I had abandoned even a good woman. I passed the dark porches of Mexican and Negro homes. Soft voices were there, occasionally the dusky voices of some mysterious sensual woman, and dark faces behind dark arbors. Little children sound like stages in ancient Rockingham, and so on. And then he concludes this section by reading, Down in Denver. Down in Denver, all I did was die. Die. And now he was dying. All I did was die down in Denver looking for the real him. Looking for his identity. Looking for it. He then returns to New York and begins to explore with all of his buddies. <coughs> the Beats were born at this particular time because they all coalesced together and then they spread out to other cities and so on. And then an enterprising young reporter picked this all up and then wrote about it in Time magazine and when he went to the interview with people, they, they said, what do you call yourselves? And they picked up the black expression. Well, we're beat, he said. We're beatniks. You remember the song, Beat to the Bar, which is a black old jazz song? That's right. So, and then it splashed across, and then pretty soon people picked up on it, the other generation, and the beat generation had therefore a premature to go with it. Now the most symbolic of all of the activities was John Carowick's On the Road 
but I mean on the road, taking off, going across, looking for it themselves. So six of them are crammed into a car in Manhattan. Kerouac writes, it was drizzling and mysterious at the beginning of our journey. You notice the opposite word journey. They were looking and seeking. I could see that all was going to be one big saga of the mist. Wooey yelled Dean, here we go. And he hunched over the wheel and gunned her. We were all delighted. We were leaving confusion and nonsense behind and performing our one and noble function of the time, move. And we moved. We flashed past the mysterious white signs in the night, somewhere in New Jersey, let's say south with an arrow, and west with an arrow, and I took the south one. New Orleans, it burned in our brains. From the dirty snows of New York, as Dean called it, all the way to the greeneries and river smells of old New Orleans at the washed out bottom of America, then west. Here we go, they shout. And with that, he turned up the console. We had to hear the, a tenor man blasting away on the radio. He was blowing his top. And Dean said, listen to him. Listen to him tell his story and his knowledge and his understanding of things, because that's what jazz meant. It came to mean more and more, especially to the beats and then to the counterculture, hippies and yippies. We all jumped to the music and the greed. And then comes the one line that I think is one of the most magnificent lines, I mean it, written about America that has ever been written. It's not very long, but it says everything. And the line is, after he says, we all jump to the music and agree, he then writes, the purity of the road. The purity of the road? That's about as far removed from puritanical America, from evangelical America, than anything else, the purity. That's what the United people were trying to achieve, the purity among themselves and with some kind of supernatural being, a great deity, God. the purity of the road. That's very American. He then writes, the, wet, the white line in the middle of the highway unrolled and hugged our left front tire as if it were glued to our groove. That, as if it was glued to our groove. What year was that? 1957. Uh, now, K yes. I'm sorry. The K was driven in 1957. I'm an old lady. Raise your voice, raise your voice. Oh, what are you kidding? Uh, Greyhound <coughs> had a, a deal for two hundred and fifty dollars. You could go across the country. Did you do so? You could go across the country, but you couldn't go back. You could go up and down, and you go all the way across from New York to, uh, to San Francisco. And I did it with a friend of mine. I left my husband. <laughs> You left your husband. Now, now it's about time you confessed. I, I did it. I went on an expired credit card. Nobody stopped. For two hundred and fifty dollars, you could go on a Greyhound bus from New York to California, but you couldn't go back. And you could go north or south, but you couldn't. You couldn't go back. That's funny. <laughs> okay, her, her, your, your, your translator just, just. <laughs> said what you said, okay. You had a point. Right? No, go ahead. Oh. Okay. Um, you, we have often seen tire marks on the road. 
where people uh, purposefully uh, uh, start to go fast on the uh, yeah. blacktop and leave part of the rubber, leaving rubber behind on, on the road. I read that that is a, w a way of stating their presence in the world, that they may be unknown, unseen, unheard, but I was here, they're saying, here is my mark. You come here, you learn stuff. But you, never, you heard it here. First of all, you're absolutely right, and it's a very incisive remark yeah. to make. It's also connected to moving. Americans move more than any other people. They migrate and they move. How many of our children have moved away from where we grew up and where we raised them and so on? I live in Massachusetts. My three daughters live in California. They don't ask. And this is not uncommon or unusual in America. This is very un-European, although they ain't caught up with the United States somewhat, because they too are into mobility, because that's where the jobs are. But Americans move. Now, going back, therefore, to the movie, not on the road movie, but to the movie I make with that DV Flex, all of this, namely, what was the movie? Easy Rider. You've forgotten already. You may recall at the end of Easy Rider, I pointed out that when they're heading back from New Orleans, remember Billy turns to Captain America and says to him, remember, we're rich. While we know we can now, we have freedom. And Captain America says, Billy, we blew it. That was the second half of the movie. The first half of the movie is when they make a killing in cocaine, and they get into their motorcycles, and they take off for New Orleans. Now, one of the most fascinating aspects about that movie, the first half of it, is that I have shown that movie every year at nauseum to my classes, and most of the students never get it. Not just the final line, which I don't expect them to get that part of it, with the first half of the movie. The first half of the movie, when they're traveling along the highways, there were no cars on the road. There were no semi trailer trucks. There's nothing. They're just them going along the highways. And they look back, look upon them on the fields, there are horses, there are cows, occasionally there's a cowboy way off herding them, but there's nothing else on the road. It is the purity of the road. That it's only when they get close to civilization that they then experience corruption, mainly southern racism, and of course eventually one of them, as you know, they're both killed, as you know, by the end of the movie. But they moved all the way New Orleans, and that's a very American thing. So when Kerouac speaks about the purity of the road, he's exemplifying one of the most important cultural aspects of our mentality. And the Beats were looking for it. Did they ever find it? You want to know? Well, they're still <laughs> It depends upon how you interpret it. <coughs> the question is Jackie Mason's, right? He was looking for the real him. Did Jackie Mason ever find the real him? Well, in a way he did because he became one of the most important stand-up comics in America. He found his true identity. But that word identity becomes so much a part of the counterculture into the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. It's part of our lexicon, and it plays a very important part of our political, because identity politics refers to what? Multiculturalism. And one of the things that sets up the conservatives is a multicultural society. And we're going to get to that tomorrow. Any questions about this or other comments?
did they get killed in Easy Rider? You said they were killed. They're riding back, and a couple of rednecks are in a truck, pickup truck. And one of them picks up his gun, his rifle. You know, and he goes to scare them while they're driving along. And instead, he hits Billy. And Billy goes, shooting up on the little motorcycle. Goes tumbling down. Captain America stops quickly, goes over to his friend, and then says to his friend, Billy, don't worry, I'm gonna go get help. Stay there. And the, one of the drivers of the pickup just says to the other, look, we can't let the other one live because there's now a witness. So he goes back and shoots Captain America. And they both die. What does he mean when he said we blew it? Ah, uh, yes. The question is, we blew it. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know what it means. We didn't find the ideal. No, I think with, with Captain America, I think if you saw the movie, it can, I can then explain a little better. He was looking for something spiritual. He was looking for a soulful, spiritual America. And by that particular time, a soulful, spiritual America was almost a misnomer to even look for. This is a corporate society. The word soulfulness doesn't really exist except in very small circles in the United States. You can have a soul mate, but we don't have a soulful culture. Corporate ethics does not permit that. And so it is elusive in the United States. All institutions in America have been corporatized. When I came to Boston University, and I went there because they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> One reason why I came there, that it was a university run by the faculty. Now, there weren't too many left in America by then, because in the 1960s, there was a chancellor of Berkeley named Clark Kirk, who delivered a very famous speech on the makings of the university. And he argued that the purpose of the university was to indeed back the corporate ethos and a corporate America. It served a very real purpose. There was that huge rebellion in Berkeley at that particular time in 1964, you may recall, the free speech movement. It was reaction against this. But there still were across the country faculty managed and run by universities, meaning they inhabited the upper echelons. And then along came a new president of the university right after. I was there, and he did what? Corporatized. He, he corporatized. BU. He made it to a corporation. Silver? Silver. Very good. Absolutely. And so suddenly the administration mushroomed. There were vice presidents upon vice presidents, and deans upon deans, and assistants to the vice presidents, and assistants to deans. And there were all kinds, it began to look Don't like criticize deans. a corporation. <laughs> What's that? Don't criticize deans. Don't criticize deans. Don't start criticizing deans here. I take it back about deans, everybody else. Okay? And pretty soon the faculty was relegated, actually, to virtually no power whatsoever. He could make whatever decision he want with the board of trustees, because he took over the board of trustees. And universities are now governed by Board of Trustees. What are corporations governed by? Board of Trustees. What about churches? Board of Trustees. Board of Trustees, exactly. And so this movement occurred all across the country. And so what Captain America was looking for was a soulful connection to America. As the beast were looking for a soulful connection to America, as the Bohemians were looking for but the emphasis they put on was mainly creativity. The creative act was indeed their salvation, their connection to all human beings, all elements of life, to nature, as well as to the humanness of the population. And that's why Kenneth Rethsborg writes in his article, right, the creative act. Dylan Thomas and Charlie Parker share the one most important things of life, the creative act. And this is what has spurred so many people in America since then, the creative act.
and I have performed my creative act in the morning. <laughs> it is so good you being here. We shall then pick this up tomorrow with the counterculture, the hips and the yippies, which we've done. Continue the beats, and then thank you. Thank you. Good to meet with you. Be well. Be good. You too.